Okay, everyone, uh, good morning. This is Bob Tribe, and this is another chapter of Valley to Vietnam. Our guest today is Bill McPoyle, who served um, in Vietnam with the Marine Corps. Bill, welcome. Thank you. We're shaking hands now. Um, Bill was born in Sacramento in 1949, correct? Yes, Sutter Memorial Hospital. Wow. So, and you, you resided where at that time? Um, well, when I was Tahoe Park. Okay. When I was born, my parents lived on Croy Way, not far from the Croy Radio Tower. Oh, sure. And then, uh, and then we later moved onto 14th Avenue, but still in Tahoe Park. Croy was the big rock and roll station in the late 50s, I guess. And early 60s, 12, yeah. uh, 12.40 a.m. Right, and there was a rival. Uh, I don't know if that was KXOA or not, but... Um, I think it was. But then, what was the big station later in the 60s that everybody listened to? Oh my gosh, I don't remember. It wasn't KXOA. I was no, I remember that. Um, anyway, what schools did you attend? I went to Tahoe Elementary School. Okay. I went to Joaquin Miller and California Junior High Schools. Okay. And I went to and graduated from McClatchy High. Oh, very good. You lived here until you were 10. Yes, I lived here until I was 10 when my father passed away. Uh, he was young, he was 42 when he died. When he passed away, we moved to Albany, California with my grandparents, my maternal grandparents for two years. Uh -huh. uh, my grandfather was a locomotive engineer, worked out of the Oakland, Southern Pacific office, or yard down there. Uh -huh. And we moved to live down there for two years and then we moved back to Sacramento. And your father also was a locomotive engineer. That's correct. He worked for Southern Pacific also. And talk about a railroad family. I mean, your your other grandfather uh, was the station master for the railroad down in Ray, Arizona, correct? That's correct. Right about the time when Pancho Villa was running the running the, the, the range down there. Did he ever, did that grandfather end up in Sacramento also, or did he stay in Arizona? No, he ended up in Sacramento as well, and he actually he was a station master in those years. He later became an auditor okay. uh, and traveled around the western United States for Southern Pacific doing audits for them. And the, your, the other grandfather we, we spoke of first, your father's father. No, my mother's father. Oh, your mother's father. He took over and had a gas station here in Sacramento. He did, during the Depression, at 34th and Folsom. It was an Associated Oil or a Flying A gas station in those days. And that's right where that Cleaners is now on the corner. Of that is correct. I think it's called Boulevard French Cleaners. And it's set way back, which would yes. allow for the, the pumps to have been out yes. front at one time. Yes, yeah. and that's exactly where they were. I drive by there every day. Yeah. Um, your dad tried to enlist in World War II. He did, and he wasn't allowed to because he worked for the Southern Pacific and railroads were one of those essential services sure. where where guys could not enlist. Right. They were shipping all the weapons to the ports and all right. that sort of thing. And transporting the troops in those exactly. days. Exactly, yeah. Um, what were some of the places um, you hung out in Sacramento? <sighs> Golly. Um, I... You know, I, yeah, I, I, when I was in high school, I worked uh, at a place on uh, 21st Street, right by the railroad tracks, called Shasta Ice Cream Parlor. Yeah. I worked there when I was in high school. Of course, you know, when I was younger than that, when I was growing up, I was a, 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 a swimmer. We used to go to the swimming pools, at, uh, particularly at, uh, at Magnon Park. Uh, down in the Hollywood Park area and okay. swam down there. I learned to swim at the Tahoe Public School, or Public uh, Swimming Pool, rather. Um, when I got older, I, uh, I was in a garage band. I played the drums. So I uh, played at different high schools and, and uh, you know, small functions and things sure. like that. And then every Friday night or Saturday night, I don't recall, they had, uh, there was a dance held at Oddfellows Hall at 11th and J. And I was I was a regular there. Okay, yeah. Um, you said that your grandfather, who had the service station, 
He had a savings plan that was kind of unique. <laughs> How he made his house payment when he during the depression. Yeah. He would uh, finish. He would go down to work, and then they lived on on Dolores Avenue or Dolores Way. I don't remember which yeah, one it is, right, right there in East Sacramento. Sure. And he would come back from the gas station, and he would bring a shoebox with his day's receipts in it. Everything was cash in those days, of course. And he'd come back, and he would count his receipts, and every night he would take a dollar out and set it aside. So at the end of the month, he had his house payment. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Money went a lot further in those days. It uh, did. You graduated from Sac High in 1968. McClatchy High. I mean, yeah. I wrote down here the wrong thing, but McClatchy. McClatchy, yeah. Sure. Don't don't put me in sack. <laughs> that was well, quite a rivalry well, in those they days. Were, yeah, they were big rivals. Oh, I remember during the uh, during the the what, what we called the Turkey Bowls, the Thanksgiving Day games. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were always doing pranks on each other, and I remember going over one night and helping put soap suds in the fountain, in <laughs> front of Sack High. <laughs> yeah. and, and I remember they those schools, those downtown high schools had these like fraternities. I think there was one called 36. 36. And I was another one called Anoya or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 36 was the big one at McClatchy. I was never a member. I okay. I, I wasn't one of that clique. Right. Well, that <laughs> I was kind of you. a I was kind of a loner yeah. in high school. I remember we'd come down and at the old fairgrounds, which were at Broadway and Stockton. Right. Um, we'd go to the dances there at Governor's Hall. Mhm. Mm and you always had to worry out, worry because there'd be a lot of sack high McClatchy kids there, and you just wanted to pretend like you were one of the kids that was, you know, ignored at one of those schools yeah. rather than <laughs> saying you came from a different high school. Yeah, uh, I remember one of my friends who I thought was tough just got beat senseless there by some sack high kid. <laughs> um, uh, so you tried when you enlisted in. The Marine Corps, you went down with your best friend, and he was going to go in with you. I did. I was all set to go into the Army Reserves. I played in a bagpipe band. I was a drummer. I played in a bagpipe band, and of course, in those days, the waiting list for the reserves were six miles long. Right. But as a member of the band, I got put to the top of the list because they wanted to keep me here to play in the band. So I was all set to go into the Army Reserves, and a friend of mine joined the Marines. And just about that time, the Pueblo was, was seized off of Korea. And I thought, you know, I, I, should, go, I should do something besides be in the reserves. So I went, came down, down here, downtown Sacramento, and walked into the recruiter's office and joined the Marines with my friend on the buddy system. Uh -huh. And we were supposed to go off to boot camp together and then go to school together and then hopefully see you know, the rest of our careers together, but at least boot camp and school. You know, you were going from probably one of the safest options by going to the Army Band versus going to the Marine Corps, which had the highest percentage of casualties. I, I uh, just, yesterday was my mother's birthday and I wandered out to the Catholic cemetery to, to uh, see her grave and I've adopted three graves around there. They're all young Marines, and it just happens those are the only ones close by that were killed, but they really had the highest ratio, highest percentage of people killed in Vietnam. That's what I've heard. I've never looked up the statistics. Yeah. But you tell us a little bit about boot camp. What was that like for you? Oh, it was a killer. <laughs> I, I For the first couple of weeks I was there, I was wishing I first hadn't done it, and secondly, I'd flunk out. Now, of course, none of those things came to be. I had done it, and I didn't flunk out. Yeah. But uh, boot camp was a was a was a different experience. But you know, I was expecting when I enlisted to go down there with the support of this buddy of mine. Uh -huh. Well, when we went down to AFES to get our physicals and take off for boot camp, I passed mine, even though I had had a motorcycle accident a few years before that, broken my leg in three places in both my arms. I passed my physical, and he failed his. So he came home, and I went to boot camp. <laughs> yeah, I had a good friend who went with me, and he he flunked the physical. They noticed that he was missing three fingers, <laughs> uh, but he wanted to go in anyway. But they didn't let him. Um, 
So after boot camp, you go to specialized training. What was that? About? I was a radio operator. I was a field radio operator. Yeah. Um, that was we, a pretty extensive training. It, well, it, it, actually, they were hurrying you through. It yeah. was a, it was a thirty day training course. We yeah. went through from boot camp. We went to infantry training regiment, where I spent three weeks in infantry, just basic infantry stuff. Right. Nothing nothing real involved, like the infantryman, like the O three eleven would go through, yeah. but a, a basic infantry course, and then on to school after that. And then, like I say, they were rushing us through. Then it was, I believe, it was a four week school, maybe. And that was located somewhere? Camp Pendleton. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. So you arrived in Vietnam when? Uh, the end of July of 1968. The good years. Um, and initially you're assigned to who? Initially I was assigned to the 7th Communications Battalion, 7th Com. And 7th Com was a, was a sort of a support unit. They had radio operators and teletype operators and wiremen. And they were kind of loaned out to different units as needed and I got loaned out to uh, after I was there for a while I got loaned out to the 3rd Amtrak Battalion at Marble Mountain. Okay and so your duties there were to go out were you at the base camp or were you going out or what? Or not at not at 3rd Tracks. At 3rd Tracks I was I stayed right in the base right at the at the base uh, I manned a, a radio relay station there uh, for for 3rd Amtrak Battalion they didn't have any radio operators that were qualified to do radio relay. It was kind of a different uh, specialization, if you will. Yeah. So I did that, and I did that until about uh, November or December, and then I came back to 7th Com, and from there went north. That was in Da Nang. From there I went north and ended up at Vandercriff Combat Base, which was outside Camelot, or just between Camelot and the rock pile. So you're out, more out in the boonies then. Yeah. And you had different duties there then at Vandegrift? Yeah, uh, we did. I uh, I was one of a couple of three guys that had a, a final secret clearance. So I, when I was at, in, in Vandegrift, when I was at Vandegrift, I was assigned to the radio that handled the classified traffic. Um, for the for for G two for intelligence and for G three which was operations, um, also from there, I went out um, with the army at at, at one time with uh, uh, Task Force Ramagan, with a Marine Corps Air Officer. We went out as an air liaison team with this Army Task Force along the Laotian border to coordinate Marine Corps Air uh, with the Army. Okay. So if they got into something really hairy and they needed some air, and then yeah, yeah, and the Air Force wasn't available, or there were there was Marine Corps air close by, we we got the air got the air on station and got them where they needed to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, where were you when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? <laughs> I remember that I was at a, on Signal Hill, up behind Vandergrift Combat Base. There was a huge hill. You can't call it a mountain, but it was a hill. Right. And uh, we ran radio relays up from that hill. We had a big antenna on a balloon that went up in the air. And we ran radio relay from that hill down to, to Vandergrift because we, Vandergrift was in sort of a valley and it was tough to get radio communication out. Somebody had to be at that station 24 hours a day. So they assigned one guy on a on a temporary basis, usually a few weeks at a time, and I happened to be there in July of '69, running that radio relay station when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and was able to listen to it because I could get Armed Forces Radio up there. Wow! Did the NVA ever try to take that hill? Yeah, I didn't. I was pretty secure up there. I I was surrounded by a group of infantrymen and a and a 106 recoilless rifle battalion, so. Yes, they did. There were some firefights out there, but I was hunched down and hunkered down in a bunker, uh, <laughs> surrounded by all these grunts, yeah. and uh, just making sure they didn't cut any wires or, or do anything like that. Sure. And you finish your first tour, and you sign up for a six-month extension. I did. I ended up my first tour with the Second Arvin Division, with an advisory team okay. um, out in the field, 
um, up north along the, DM, the area of the DMZ. And while I was there, uh, I extended and uh, uh, signed up for a, a, for a six-month extension. Okay. But did, would that give you an early out if you did that, or what was... No. You just wanted to stay there, or what was the reason? <laughs> well... <laughs> Crazy? <laughs> Well, there was a 30-day leave attached to it, oh, okay. and you didn't get charged for that leave. Uh -huh. So I was able to come home for 30 days and then go back again the second okay. time, and it wasn't taken off of my leave. It right. was it was just a, it was a gratis for that, and and I wanted to get back. I wanted to come back when I was at Task Force Hotel. I uh, got to be good friends with some of the guys from Third Recon Battalion. So when I extended, I extended specifically for 3rd Recon. So when I came back, I was able to go to 3rd Recon Battalion. And these were like four or five man teams who were out there on yeah. a regular basis? Yeah, they went out and uh, we went out and, uh, and basically gathered intelligence. We went out where there were supposed to be enemy troops, supposed to be NVA, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, basically uh, in those days we called it snoop and poop. Uh, yeah. where we just went out and we were quiet. Our job wasn't to engage. Our job was to go out, gather intelligence, and if we saw a target worthwhile, we could call in artillery or air support or that kind of a thing. But basically just to, to let the infantry and the, and the higher-ups know what was going on. So you, you finish that extension and then you go back to the States? Yes. And what, mm. where did you go? What did you do? I went initially to uh, El Toro, Marine Corps Air Station, El Toro, which is down in Orange County. Right. Um, from there, I uh, ended up at, at a smaller base. It was uh, an old, uh, it was called LTA. It was the old dirigible base in Santa yeah. Ana. Okay. And there was a Marine Corps hel helicopter squadron there at that time. And I ended up there for a month or so, <coughs> pardon me, for a month or so, and then they asked for volunteers. I got promoted to corporal there. They asked for volunteer NCOs to go to San Diego to be with the uh, MPs, with the Marine Detachment at the Naval Base at 32nd Street and at Miramar, and I volunteered for that and went down and, and became a, a part of the security detachment. Okay. Um. Now, once you, you got out of the service in 1971? Correct, February. Yeah, and you, did you return to Sacramento then? Or? I, I did, I stayed in San, uh, San Diego for a while. I was an ambulance driver. In those days, all you needed to be an ambulance driver was a first aid guard. Right. And I had a first aid guard, so I, uh, I drove an ambulance for a little bit, but eventually came home, uh, probably in September, somewhere around there. And, uh, and went back to school and continued driving an ambulance for Sacramento Ambulance here. And by going back to school, where did you go to school? Sacramento City College. Okay. And then Sac State. And then Sac State, but there was a big time in there when I didn't go to school because out of Sacramento City College, I got hired by the police department. Sac PD. Sac PD. Okay. And when I was at Sac PD, I did not go to school. I, okay. I, I was happy being a police officer. I went a couple of times and really didn't like it that much. Uh, so I just was, was, was moving along as a cop. And were you uh, in patrol or what did you do? I was in patrol most of the time. I spent four years in the detective division. I worked uh, uh, the larceny fraud division and I worked uh, child abuse, mainly child sexual abuse. And uh, went back to patrol and then I tackled a guy down at the uh, community center in the theater down there. Uh -huh. um, it was trying to get away from me from a stupid misdemeanor and broke both my knees. Oh boy. So I was eventually retired by the police department. And you had been with the police department how long? About 13 years. Okay. Um, then you went back to school. Then I went back to school. I, right. I had no skills other than <laughs> chasing bad guys. Right. You know, what am I going to do? So yeah. I went back to school. And I, I ended up going back to city for another year or so, and then transferring to Sac State. Okay, and then you graduated from Sac State? I graduated from Sac State. Right before I graduated, I was offered a job with the 
uh, with an employee relations firm, uh, Employer Representation Services, of which I eventually became an owner. Um, the uh, uh, the boss there, or one of the bosses, and and I had worked at the police department together, and we're on the union, the police union board together. So he knew that I knew a little bit about labor relations and wanted to know if I wanted to come to work there. So I, I gave it a try and ended up staying there for almost 20 years. Wow. Yeah, it was good work. I enjoyed it. Yeah. You continued at school. You ended up getting your master's degree? I did. I have a master's degree in history. Okay. And you taught? I taught at Golden Gate University and at Chapman University College. Okay. Um, what are you currently working on? I'm currently working on my second book. I wrote a book last year about uh, Sacramento baseball. It's going to be released on February 27th of 2017, right in time for spring training. Uh -huh. And uh, now I'm, I'm working on a book about um, the turmoil in the Bay Area, the free speech movement, the Black Panthers, the summer of love, and of course the Giants and the A's in the late 60s. Oh, okay. And the title of your first book? Sacramento Baseball. Oh, okay. It's an easy one. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you dis this discussion on your second book because um, when I got out of the service in 1969, I was recruited by a state task force uh, under the Office of Criminal Justice Planning and they had task forces, they had a law enforcement task force, a criminal justice or, or a, a judicial process, a, a, a correctional service, and they had a riots and disorders task force. And they asked me if I'd be the staff for that. And I had some background in that because I was doing some of that in the Army. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, but essentially all those big riots, I usually got to attend. And Lucky you. Yeah, that was that was really incredible, incredible stuff that was going on. I mean, it was. you could write a lot of books about some of the things. Yeah, that yeah there's quite a few books out there, but I don't think there's, I'm, I'm hoping there's none. I haven't been able to find any like the one I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's going to have, uh, you know, there's two, there were two constants at that time. There was, you know, of course, there was free speech in 64, 65. There was the Black Panthers in 66. There was the San Francisco State thing in 67. On through 69 and 70, there were other things as well. But there were two constants. One of them was baseball, yeah. which is my first love. Right. And the second one was the anti-war protests going on down there right. uh, for Vietnam, the anti-Vietnam protests. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit both of those things as well as the, as the kind of the undertone of the whole period. Sure. Well, you know, I just remember we were, we were looking at uh, SLA. Uh, we were looking at the, what was going on with some of the Panthers. And I remember going down to L.A. for meetings and uh, uh, Charles Manson was being tried and all these Manson followers were out there with big X's right. cut into their foreheads. So. Yeah. It was a fascinating yeah. time. We had, a, we had SLA. Of course, we had Panthers here in Sacramento as well. Sure. I'm not going to be looking at them in my book because I'm focusing on the Bay Area. But uh, we also had SLA uh, activity, if you will. There was never any violence. But Patty Hearst was spotted here once or allegedly spotted here once. Yeah. And I remember being on part of the group that staged out at Grant High School and we were going to, I was part of the group that was going to move on her when they located her. Sure. And they never did. Well, she did. was identified at that bank robbery in yes. Carmichael. Where yes. And it turns out that night when we were out at Grant, when we thought she was in the North Area, she was in an apartment down on W Street. Yeah, right on W. Yeah. Very good. Well, do you have any feelings about your service with the Marines that you would oh, like to mention? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my service. Yeah. I have no regrets. Um, you know, I've gotten pretty liberal since that time, and I, I look at things differently now than I did then with, uh, you know, 50 years of, of hindsight. Um, but I will never, ever regret going in. I will never, ever regret going to Vietnam. I mean, it was just something that needed to be done at that time. Our country asked us to do it, and I did it. Um, so I, I have a lot of respect for the guys that did. I have a lot of respect for the guys that are going now. 
um, to, you know, to Afghanistan and Iraq and, and other places in the world. But, um, you know, um, I, like I say, I, I stayed in the Marines, in the reserves after I got out and eventually became a gunnery sergeant and uh, in, an intelligence chief. And I have absolutely zero regret and a lot of pride of, in, in my Marine Corps service. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for coming in today. Um, it's a good story. Thanks for sharing it with us. Well, it was my so pleasure. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you got this project going. It's a, it looks like a, an excellent project, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the other interviews as well. Well, we're pretty proud of it, and Jerry Ward and James Scott are the, the real heroes here, so I uh, greatly applaud them for coming up with this thing. So thanks again. You bet.